Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Those are the rules. And I want you to obey the goddamn rules! It is impossible to understand David Lynch's 1996 film, Lost Highway, without understanding the complex symbolic infrastructure of the film's universe. The film has people walking through holes in space, dead people returning, and time looping. Dick Laurent is dead. These images are used to create an intense emotional reaction, mostly anxiety and wonder. Give me back my phone. It's true that Lynch is intuitive, not empirical. He doesn't create a set of rules for his stories, but there is an internal logic to all this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be surreal. It would be random. In other words, I cannot reverse engineer Lynch's creative process, but I can tell you what's happening in this film. While Lost Highway is baffling, there is at least a tiny fingernail grip that fans have on understanding the film. Lynch's admission that the story was inspired by the murder of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman by former American football star O.J. Simpson. Lynch has gone on record calling O.J. Simpson's state of mind a psychogenic fugue state, and acknowledging that Lost Highway protagonist Fred Madison is in the same condition. This has led most fans to presume that Fred murdered Renee Madison, and then he went into a dream world where he is not only innocent, but also a completely different guy named Pete Dayton. The Pete is a dream theory seems to be the accepted explanation for a lost highway. Matt Murray of Corn Pone Flicks presents the best summary of this theory. This, then, is Fred's ultimate act of recalling events not necessarily the way they happened. He's no longer even Fred Madison. Murray is an excellent film analyst and I highly recommend his channel. However, the Pete is a dream theory is just wrong. There are too many inconsistencies with this interpretation, but the big one is the scene near the end at Andy's house where the two detectives from the real world reconnoiter with the two detectives from the dream world. Police detectives Al and Ed arrested Fred and are presumably in the real world, and police detectives Hank and Lou are following Pete, so we presume that they are in the dream world. It's not clear where in the course of reality this is meant to have happened, but why would he be imagining events in which he played no part? Is this suggesting that Fred actually turned into Pete? Once you believe that Pete is a dream, you're stuck rationalizing all the evidence to the contrary. What about when Pete turns back into Fred? This is Fred waking up from the dream, right? Well then why is he in the desert instead of in his prison cell? What about the mystery man's presence at these events? Surely such a bizarre ghoul is a figment of Fred's imagination, right? But Dick Laurent refers to Fred and the mystery man as you guys. What do you guys want? Can Laurent see Fred's hallucination? Or is Fred imagining that Laurent can see the mystery man? If yes to the latter, then why do we assume that Laurent is even there? Or that any of this is real? You see the problem. Let's give ourselves permission to ignore that and place the events in chronological order. Renee is wearing the dress she has at Andy's party, so she goes home and waits for Fred to take her to the party. Fred kills Dick Laurent, goes home, hides the Mercedes Benz, changes clothes after explaining to Renee why he was wearing a black leather jacket, takes Renee to the party, comes home, waits for Renee to fall asleep, goes back to the party, kills Andy, goes back home, kills Renee if we assume that this is all one night puts the leather jacket back on, leaves the house, and collects Dick Laurent's car, wherever it may be, and goes back to the house so he can tell somebody that Dick Laurent is dead. Dick Laurent is dead. And after 24 hours of running around in this leather jacket, I'm about to die. Am I right, guys? In Lynch's Mulholland Drive, there is a clear demarcation between the dream world and the real world, a rare display of charity from Lynch. There is no scene in Lost Highway that is plainly real, and therefore no way to interpret a dream sequence as a commentary on the dreamer's mental state. Unreliable narrator is one thing, but indecipherable narrator isn't really anything. Perhaps in the end, the entire film is Fred's fractured recollection of events, both true and imagined wholesale. But this is essentially giving up, saying that certain mysteries don't count if they're not real. Let's take a look at the scene where Fred is in prison and he sees a hole open up in space that takes the shape of curtains opening and he sees another place, a desert and a shack inside in which he sees the mystery man. Like most of the movie, the image gives us a sense of anxiety and wonder. It is utterly fantastical. Fred doesn't know what's happening and we don't know what's happening, so in a way, we are locked in the cell. It is tempting to say that this is Fred's imagination, but we are not required to assume that. Who's to say that a hole in space can't open up? This is a movie. Let's figure out what's going on here. A 
film series called Place Real has posted a video that points out similarities between David Lynch's work and Oliver Stone's work, and also similarities between Lynch's later work and those same Oliver Stone projects. Place Real claims that Lynch is stealing from the Steelers and calling out plagiarism. His 1997 film Lost Highway voices a critique of what he saw as the plagiarism of his own work. Surreal show on ABC Primetime. Incongruous animal in house. Horse in living room, rhinoceros in kitchen. Leading man commits murder and then goes to jail in opening. Lead female is raped and rapist is immolated. Young lovers on run from the law commit murder. Here's the big one. Actors in Lost Highway play characters that are almost identical to their characters in Palms and Killers, respectively. Robert Loggia as bombastic villain whose death is ambiguous. Protagonist is impotent and sees wife is old man. Tailgating turns violent. Protagonist is framed for murder of wife. Balthazar Getty as relatable mechanic seduced by female lead. Did Lynch cast these parts in order to comment on Stone's alleged plagiarism? My first thought was, well, no, obviously. Casting is such an important decision, and financiers that outrank the director are involved. Then I realized that Place Real had ignored something. Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino has also been accused of plagiarizing from Lynch. Tarantino co-wrote the screenplay for Natural Born Killers, and Tarantino also co-wrote the screenplay for the Tony Scott-directed True Romance, which also has strong similarities to Wild at Heart, and Tarantino has been accused of lifting ideas from Wild at Heart. Plus, the leading lady in True Romance is Patricia Arquette, who plays a similar character in Lost Highway. Young lovers on run from the law plot robbery. Leading man worships and emulates Elvis Presley. Patricia Arquette as blonde bombshell who plots theft with protagonist. That's a locus of three actors from three movies by two accused filmmakers. And we can say that this is not a coincidence. Lynch is definitely making a statement with his casting choices. But why? Lost Highway was written during a dark time in Lynch's life. A time after his film Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me bombed and almost destroyed his career. At this same time, rising star director Quentin Tarantino went so far as to attack Lynch. After I saw Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me at Cannes, David Lynch had disappeared so far up his own ass that I have no desire to see another David Lynch movie until I hear something different. And you know, I loved him. I loved him. That's the only part of the interview that I can quote. The rest was pornographic descriptions of women's feet and racial slurs. I will try to avoid psychoanalyzing Lynch, but it's not a stretch to assume that this enraged him, even if enraged means a slight shrug of the shoulders as he drinks a Bob's Big Boy milkshake. When Dick Laurent is being tailgated and he tailgates the tailgater, Place Real interprets this as Lynch being plagiarized and then plagiarizing the plagiarizers. I think Place Real is partially correct, but isn't it weird to think that Dick Laurent is supposed to represent David Lynch? Lynch often does self-inserts, most famously his Twin Peaks character of regional director and later deputy director Gordon Cole is him, the director, appearing as the director. It seems very strange that Lynch would have a vicious mafioso represent him. I will address that contradiction later. Place Reel's theory is true but insufficient. There is much more going on in Lost Highway, but keep Tarantino and Stone in the back of your mind. Like the time loop in the movie, we will come back to this. So that's where the common wisdom is when I begin this essay. Now let us begin the task of examining the many metaphors and developing a complete theory. At five times in the movie, we see a dark two-lane desert highway at night. This is the lost highway of the film's title. Think about the actual physical film running past a projector bulb. If we move the observer to the inside of the projector and change the angle of the light, it kind of looks like a dark highway. Now let's imagine that there are two bulbs and two strips of film parallel to each other to mimic the two eyes of a human. The sprocket holes will form a series of dashes that rush by us, just like the lines on a highway. Lost Highway, the highway, is Lost Highway, the film. If the highway is black, that means that the film is black, and we are observing the film from this vantage point when the audience in the theater is seeing blackness. Usually credits are words on black, so the opening credits are seen against the highway image. We see the credits literally fly at us, just like the successive still images of the credits would appear to move towards us from this orthogonal viewpoint. The closing credits, the fifth time we see the highway, are also over this image, even though they scroll normally. After the opening credits, the picture fades to black for 10 seconds. That's a very long time to hold on black. However, we are dissolving from a metaphorical presentation of a black screen to a literal black screen, 
and I think that the long stretch of darkness exists to let us know that we are not merely transitioning to the movie beginning, but transitioning to a new metaphysical space. The second time we see The Lost Highway is when Fred Madison transforms into Pete. The car zips down the highway and stops to illuminate Pete, who is just standing there on the side of the road. It seems like the car is choosing Pete. That's no accident. The movie is selecting a new protagonist. At first glance, Pete is in the same scene as Sheila. We can soon see that Pete is in a different location than Sheila, as it becomes clear that the two characters are on two strips of film superimposed over each other. Slowly, we can see that the lighting and camera movements don't match. Later, we see the B layer of the composite by itself. From Sheila's point of view, Pete has vanished. The scene is frightening because the characters are helpless, and we feel a sympathetic helplessness because we don't know what's going on. All of the theories about Pete being a dream are rationalizations designed to explain why the protagonist changes after the first act. They are unnecessary if we assume that the film itself has sufficient agency to do this. So where did Pete come from? Well, he appears to be in front of what we will later learn to be his house with his father, Bill Dayton, his mother, Candace Dayton, and his girlfriend, Sheila. However, he is not there. It looks like he is there, but his image is superimposed over the image of the other characters and the house. There has been a Pete movie running parallel to a Fred movie, just as roads run parallel to each other. No, it's not the Lynch cinematic universe, but it's pretty close. The third time we see the titular Lost Highway is when Alice Wakefield and Pete drive the stolen red Ford Mustang to the mystery man's house. The characters have left their world and entered a very different place. The first time we see the mystery man's shack is through the hole in space in Fred's cell. It is a metaphysically distant place, like another dimension, but there is a physical way to get there, the Lost Highway. The next and fourth time we see the highway is when Fred drives the Red Mustang to the Lost Highway Hotel. This puts the mystery man's shack and the hotel in the other place. This is confirmed by an earlier scene. The most jarring example of the magic portal is when Pete goes to the second floor of Andy's house and finds himself in the Lost Highway Hotel. We can now start to understand the lines of demarcation between these two worlds. We have the world of the movie, Los Angeles, and this otherworldly space east of the City of Angels in the Mojave Desert. What does this framing device tell us about Fred? Fred is not just the protagonist, Fred represents protagonists in general. Fred has no existence outside of the movie Lost Highway. In the first scene, Fred is sitting in darkness as light slowly reveals him. Who's turning on all those lights? There's no one else in the house. It is not the light that is coming into existence, but Fred himself. In the end of the movie, Fred disintegrates. This effect is similar to the effect where Fred becomes Pete, so it has been speculated that Fred is transforming again. Also, Fred was sentenced to die in the electric chair, but how do you kill a character in a film? The electrical chair shuts off the flow of electricity to the brain, and when a film ends, the electricity to the projector is shut off. Fred has been sentenced to have his story end. This is why he appears to be electrocuted when he turns into Pete because Fred is effectively dead if he stops being the main character of the film. Since Pete transforms back into Fred, the annihilation is reversed. However, when the movie ends, there is no survival for Fred and he disintegrates. Note that cause and effect are reversed. The movie doesn't end because Fred is annihilated. Fred is annihilated because the movie ends. So what is this otherworldly place where we can find the mystery man's shack and the spooky hotel? Remember, there is an animation of curtains opening when the portal is opened from Fred's cell to the mystery man's shack. The curtain animation tells us everything we need to know. If we think of the characters as being on a stage, even though they're in a film, the curtain leads to backstage, and all the people and things that make a movie can be found here. The other world is outside of the story or diegesis. I try to avoid using Greek words I learned in film school, but it is the official and correct term for this. The story takes place on a metaphorical stage that is the diegesis, and the mystery man's shack and the lost highway hotel are outside the diegesis. For now, let's think of the mystery man as broadly representing the people outside the diegesis, including the film crew. The diegesis incorporates all of Los Angeles, where most American films are made, and the Mojave Desert outside the diegesis is outside of Los Angeles accessible by dusty two-lane roads, exactly like The Lost Highway. Let me pause here to remind you that I am explaining the film and not trying to reconstruct Lynch's process. In other words, Lynch doesn't have a notebook with the word diegesis written down a hundred times. Why does the backstage appear as a shack on stilts? This could be a reference to the final shot from Wild Palms. 
but more likely Lynch is making a reference to the film Kiss Me Deadly, which ends with a similar but bigger beach house catching on fire. It is possible to interpret the beach house as being in a separate metaphysical space from the other locations. I'm not proffering an explanation for Kiss Me Deadly, I'm just saying that this could easily be Lynch's interpretation. Additionally, the mystery man's house has a chair and a couch, just like the Red Room in Twin Peaks, which is supposed to represent the backstage of the television series. If we look at film and TV as a play happening on a stage, then the red curtains act as a sort of portal, a clear separation between the dream world happening on the stage and the real world, where the audience watches the dream and the people backstage create it. The mystery man's shack appears to be a rundown version of the Red Room. The mystery man is quite similar to the dwarf. Backstage is a limbo filled with nefarious and distorted characters. So why does the mystery man appear so strange? With black clothes, a white face, slick back hair, and no eyebrows, he is a blank slate. We can't deduce anything about him. If you're the character in a film, and you saw the filmmakers, what would you think of them? You wouldn't know who they are, what they are, where they came from, or how to put their existence into any meaningful context. You'd see a mystery man. This is why so many things in Lost Highway are weird. We are seeing reality from the point of view of characters who do not know that they are unreal. Like all of his films, Lynch is drawing us into the movie by reminding us of the terror and wonder, the helplessness and freedom we feel in these situations. But why do mysterious things happen inside the diegesis? Simple. The boundary between the two worlds is being broken. There are multiple examples of trespassers in the Madison House, even though locked doors and alarms would make their presence a physical impossibility. The real-life people who make movies have access to the Fred movie, and even though a fictional character would be unaware of the artifice of their reality, Fred is seeing the film crew. Someone turns on the lights in the first scene. Who would do that? Why the lighting crew, of course. When Fred and Renee Madison return from the party, we can see people in the house moving lights around. They are not unintentionally moving the lights around while performing some nefarious act. They are specifically moving the lights around. They are the lighting crew. Someone was in the house filming Fred and Renee. Of course they were. That's what the film crew would do. We see the shadow of two people on the night of the murder. Those are two members of the crew. The mystery man can not only enter the Madison house at will, but he can be there and in another location at the same time. How does one bilocate? If one represents not a person, but a group of people, it's no problem. If the crew has access to the diegesis, then the videotapes make sense. If you look at the images on the tape, most of them are scenes from the film. According to the script, they were all supposed to be scenes from the movie. Fred, a character in a movie, is receiving videotape dubs of scenes from the movie that he's in. This is more explicit in the shooting script. Al and Ed, the police officers called in when the second videotape arrives, notice something that most filmmakers in the audience noticed. The images on the videotape are professionally made. The camera movements are too smooth to be a handheld camera, and when the camera goes up high, it's too high. The intruder would need a crane, the exact one used to shoot the real movie Lost Highway. In fact, the camera is supposed to be so high that the height of the ceiling would prohibit such a move. To a character in the film who doesn't know that they're a character in a film, this would be some spooky shit. We also have an explanation for the scene where Fred looks straight into the camera and is scared senseless, as if he sees an intruder. Fred is seeing the camera. This shot really gives away the store, in my opinion. In a later scene, he looks into the camera again and walks down the hallway. However, first he looks directly into the camera, and then there is a cut to a continuous shot where he looks at something off screen. The film has cut from a first person perspective to a third person perspective so that the camera can become a character in the movie. Fred walks down the darkened hallway. It's rare for a character to walk from the light into complete blackness, but Fred wasn't supposed to walk down the hallway. The character is now doing what he wants instead of what he is supposed to do. Fred is disobeying the film. When he walks down the hall, he's committing the ultimate act of rebellion. Fred is walking out of the movie. This is one of the most iconic shots in the movie. We feel a sense of danger and a sense of exhilaration, exactly what we feel in real life when we are doing something risky of our own volition. You may have felt like Fred is moving into a very different place, a different dimension, a space where his very nature will be altered. You were right. Let's assume that the Madison house is a set. If no character walks down the hall in the scene, the crew might not even attach to the connecting piece, the living room. Think of it this way. If an actor walked off the set, instead of being in the Madison house, and therefore in the diegesis, they would be at the craft services table or video village or whatever. But if the character has no external life as an actor, 
then he has essentially walked through a magic portal. Fred does not emerge from the darkness into the living room, but rather he finds a mirror. Is this a comment on duality? Is Fred confronting his true self? Is he splitting into two Freds, one of whom is a murderer? The important thing is that the mirror isn't supposed to be there. Fred is surprised to see the mirror. So where is Fred? Fred is in a dressing room. If this seems like a leap, remember that Pete encounters the same mirror. Surely Pete didn't walk 20 miles to the Madison house and stumble up to a mirror. Pete has also exited the diegesis, and he's just as troubled as Fred by the mystery. The first thing that Pete notices is that his head wound, the laceration on his forehead and the swelling around his eye, is gone. Well, of course it's gone. In the diegesis, it's swollen and bruised flesh. It takes time to heal. In the dressing room, Pete's head wound is makeup. The reverse of this phenomenon happens. Renee removes her makeup in the bathroom mirror, and afterwards, she still has makeup on. She cannot remove the makeup in the diegesis if it was applied outside the diegesis, which it was, by the makeup artist for the film. Do we ever see that mirror again? Blink and you'll miss it. There is a mirror in room 26, and it is the same mirror that Fred and Pete found earlier in the film. The Lost Highway Hotel represents the studio where Lost Highway the movie is being shot. This is why Pete goes upstairs in Andy's house and finds himself in the hotel. Just like Fred wasn't supposed to walk down the dark hallway, Pete wasn't supposed to go upstairs. If he wasn't supposed to go upstairs, he would wander out of the diegesis and find himself in the studio. Note that the farthest exit is a red curtain. This tracks with Lynch's style, as the Great Northern Hotel at Twin Peaks is supposed to represent the studio that is making the real show Twin Peaks. The Great Northern Hotel can be described as a house or box that people or characters inhabit with many rooms or sets occupied by different souls or characters night after night. Remember, surrealism is not weirdness for its own sake. Effective surrealism has a consistent internal logic. So a lot of the bizarre events in Lost Highway can be explained as the protagonist discovering that he is a character in a film and responding to this knowledge with fear, confusion, and ultimately violence. But is there another overarching metaphor for film sewn into the fabric of Lost Highway? Yes, there is, and it explains why Pete, our replacement protagonist, is a mechanic. He has to fix this broken movie. In Twin Peaks, Lynch uses vehicles as a metaphor for TV shows and certain operators as metaphors for certain viewers. Truck drivers like crappy TV shows. The theft of a vehicle represents the theft of artistic control. Specifically, a truck stolen from a character played by Lynch perennial Jack Nance represents the studio stealing creative control from Lynch. The log lady stole my truck. Using vehicles to represent films or TV shows is an established Lynchian device. But first, let's talk about the difference between Fred and Pete. The common wisdom is that Pete is supposed to be the opposite of Fred. Fred is impotent and a murderer. Pete is virile and not a murderer. Well, initially. However, the idea that Pete represents innocence is absurd. He's merely not a murderer. He hangs out with criminals and has a criminal record for stealing a car. Is Pete more virile than Fred? While Pete has lots of great sex, Fred isn't an old man dreaming he's a young man. Pete is only eight years younger than Fred. If Pete is supposed to represent an ideal of innocence, why does he live in Van Nuys? Why is his father Gary Busey instead of Hugh Beaumont? The difference is hearing. Fred and Pete have different senses of hearing. Pete has good hearing and Fred does not. Pete is supposedly a mechanic, but he and his colleagues appear to be altering the sound of cars and not doing any complicated repairs. Mr. Eddie treasures Pete because Pete makes his Mercedes-Benz sound good. Best goddamn is in town. Later, when bugs are crawling around Pete's room, he is tormented because he can hear every one of them. In the script, Pete is tormented by the sound of his friend's clunker, and there are even more detailed scenes which establish his superhuman hearing. Tone deaf. Detective Al says this to Fred, indicating that he could never play tenor sax for a living like Fred does. But he could. Fred's playing is so jerky and screechy, you could easily think that Fred is tone deaf. Fred is all about noise. Pete is all about sound. When Fred's saxophone solo comes on the radio at the garage, Pete turns it off, disgusted. This is the only time these characters are actually contrasted in a meaningful way. Now let's take a closer look at what kinds of sounds Pete doesn't like. He can hear the spider and the moths in his bedroom. The spider is a black widow, and a femme fatale character like Alice is often called a black widow. The moths are attracted to the light even though it's killing them. Moths to the flame is a common expression for the dangerous situation that Pete is in. 
Doing something he knows is dangerous because of an irrational attraction to something. Pete thrives in movies where everything is clear and straightforward, and not this metaphorical. Pete can't stand symbolism. The bug metaphors that take over his bedroom are as repulsive as the sound of a clunker at Ventura Boulevard. This happens at least one more time when Andy's head goes through the glass coffee table. I think that Andy broadly represents consumers of lowest common denominator films that contain exploitative sex and violence. Lynch would probably say that someone like that is metaphorically destroying his mind, so Andy's mind is literally destroyed. This metaphor is so pronounced that Pete has to flee the room to get a painkiller. Certainly being an accessory to murder would cause someone anguish, but Pete seems to be having the same pain that he had in his bedroom. He is the antithesis of Lynchian. Symbolism repels him. Pete makes cars sound better, which means that Pete makes movies easier to take. The repellent sound of a car in need of a repair is what art films feel like to the average person. Pete is a lovable blue-collar cutie, not at all like the tormented, dangerous Fred who likes cacophonous jazz and mopes around his disorienting expressionist house. Pete is a stock character. Pete is the kind of likable and comforting character that you would want as a protagonist if, say, for example, you're a third of the way through a film and the esoteric protagonist has done nothing to make the film accessible. Pete should do real American things like go to a bowling alley or go out dancing. Pete goes dancing at a bowling alley. So Pete is a character that goes from movie to movie, and if movies are represented by vehicles, then Pete should go from vehicle to vehicle. Here is Pete's record of vehicle usage. Pete is driven home in his parents' white 1965 Ford Country Squire. Pete is driven around town in his friend's jalopy, deleted scene. Pete is given a ride by Mr. Eddie in his black Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL. Pete drives his black 1967 Plymouth Belvedere to pick up Sheila and have sex with her in the back seat. Pete drives Alice in Mr. Eddie's other car, a Cadillac Series 62 convertible. Pete drives his black Harley Davidson to have sex with Sheila in a hotel. I would think that a gentleman would have offered her a ride. Pete takes a bus to Andy's house. Pete drives Andy's stolen red Ford Mustang to the Lost Highway. The plot seems to be written to constantly have Pete in a different vehicle and in different types of vehicles. Of course, for Lost Highway fans, one particular trip stands out. Mr. Eddie slash Dick Laurent isn't the first person we see who is an enthusiastic fan of Pete's. Here's Pete's boss, Arnie. Let's go get back. A lot of people are gonna be real happy that you're back, including me. Arnie has an almost comical enthusiasm for Pete's return to the shop. Pete is back! The first customer Arnie mentions is not Mr. Eddie, but Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith is waiting for you. Yeah, I'll take care of him. Pete has widespread mainstream appeal. Any old Mr. Smith would love Pete. Pete is the textbook protagonist that audiences and filmmakers love. So does Mr. Eddie represent a director or directors in general? Sort of. In a film that's set in L.A., he and Andy are the only characters who are literally filmmakers. But Andy doesn't seem like the main guy. Laurent slash Eddie does. Let's just think of Mr. Eddie as the director. He uses a stock character like Pete in his movie, which is represented by his Mercedes-Benz. And now we can understand the tailgating scene. Mr. Eddie is very concerned with his car sounding a certain way, purring like a kitten. He is enjoying a drive along Mulholland Drive. He is going slowly because he is enjoying the experience. A tailgater aggressively approaches him because this driver is in a hurry. He does not want to experience the drive. He wants to get to his destination. Mr. Eddie is experiential, and the tailgater is goal-oriented. The tailgater is a filmmaker who makes films that are disposable and forgettable. Can these two coexist? Can we have cerebral films and popcorn movies? Well, of course we can. Every audience member can do their own thing. Mr. Eddie is conciliatory. With poise and graciousness, he gestures the tailgater to pass him while keeping an eye on oncoming traffic for his benefit. The scene could end right there, except that the tailgater makes an obscene gesture. Mr. Eddie crashes into the tailgater and assaults him. Do you know how many fucking car lengths it takes to stop a car at 35 miles an hour? Six fucking Charlie! That's 106 fucking feet, mister! If I had to stop trembling, you would have hit me! However, 106 is not a multiple of six. The correct number is 108 feet. The average screenplay is 106 pages, according to some sources. Additionally, guides to screenwriting suggest this as the maximum length. 106 is a number I heard all the time in film school. As for 35 miles an hour, almost every feature is shot on 35mm film. 
The tailgating scene is humorous because, while consumed with violent rage, Mr. Eddie lectures the tailgater on the rules of safe driving. If you took out the profanity, it could be something a mild-mannered driving instructor would say. Mr. Eddie wants filmmakers to do things right. Use stock characters like Pete. Pace your film properly. I want you to get a fucking driver's manual! I want you to study that motherfucker! And I want you to obey the goddamn rules! Tell me you're gonna get a manual! Do what they teach in film school. These lessons symbolized by the safe driving manual. Now we have a contradiction. Mr. Eddie is experiential and not goal-oriented, and that perfectly reflects David Lynch's philosophy of slow-moving scenes that play on emotions and not hitting story beats. In fact, the reason he left Twin Peaks is because they forced him to reveal the killer, focusing on the goal, not the experience, and this destroyed the show. Lynch wanted the viewers to mosey along and enjoy the view, but the network wanted him to hurry up and get to the destination. But does it make sense that Mr. Eddie represents David Lynch? It is not Lynchian to insist a filmmaker obey the rules or to impose his will with violence. He wouldn't portray himself as a maker of pornography. He wouldn't portray himself as a violent gangster played by an actor famous for playing aggressive and dangerous men. He might give a character based on himself his real initials, DL, and he might have a character based on himself claim, I'm really out ugly now, some bitch. As he often proudly says that the dark parts of his films are ugly. What everybody else finds ugly, I find beautiful. Things that seem ugly are beautiful at the same time, and things that seem beautiful are ugly at the same time. Beauty and ugliness are interconnected, and you can't tell them apart in a way. So what's going on? Can we reconcile these contradictions? Yes, we can. Dick Laurent slash Mr. Eddie is what David Lynch looks like to someone who doesn't like David Lynch. I had suggested that the mystery man represents the crew of a film, but it's bigger than that. He represents filmmakers, critics, and the community at large. After the failure of Twin Peaks, Lynch felt like this community had abandoned him. The mystery man ultimately kills Dick Laurent. Did Lynch feel this level of betrayal when he started writing Lost Highway? Well, if we assume that the movie is a very exaggerated version of the dark place Lynch was in, then yes. So now the thesis of Lost Highway is coming into focus. Lynch is commenting on other filmmakers who threw him under the bus. When the first line of the movie is heard, Dick Laurent is dead. Let's assume that it is literally true. The only other character who dies in the first act is Rene. There are only two characters who appear in the second act as different characters, the same two characters who have died, Dick Laurent who returns as Mr. Eddie, and Rene Madison who returns as Alice Wakefield. Andy is still Andy, and the new cops, Hank and Lou, are completely different characters from Al and Ed. The fact that it's the dead characters who return with new identities prompts me to think that they are returning from the dead. To explain this, let me take a hypothetical but more familiar example to explain the dynamic. Let's say that after the first act, the producers decide that they want Patricia Arquette to stay in the film. They could bring her back as Renee's twin sister, Alice. If they don't need to explain why the same actress has returned, she could simply be Alice, a new character. Now let's say that it's not Patricia Arquette, the actress, but Renee, the character, who wishes to return. Characters can return as new characters in Lost Highway because actors can return as new characters in real life. She could simply put on a blonde wig and re-enter the diegesis and say, I'm Alice Wakefield. And she is functionally resurrected. This is what happened. If my conjecture about Renee wearing a blonde wig sounds fishy, since Alice is clearly not wearing a wig, remember that if Renee puts on a wig outside of the diegesis, it will be real blonde hair inside the diegesis. Alice is Renee. She is not the dream version of Renee. She is Renee. So I thought, well, I could play one very different than the other one. And that could be really exciting as an actor to really change the vocal quality of each and change all these, the way they spoke, the way they moved themselves. But he kept saying to me, they are the same person. That They are the same person. As for Mr. Eddie, well, he doesn't even bother changing his hair or his clothes or anything. Apparently, different movies are all in the same diegesis, so characters can cross over like superheroes in Marvel Comics, and they can return from the dead just as easily. You recognize that guy? Yeah, no, Ron. This is why Hank and Lou immediately recognize Mr. Eddie as Dick Laurent, as Dick Laurent exists in their world, and presumably his activities would attract the attention of the police. There is one police department for all the L.A.-based movies. Maybe Laurent needed a blonde wig as well. So we can think of the first act as the Fred movie, and the second act as the Pete movie. Just like actors who play a character who dies in one movie 
can return and play a similar character with a different name in another movie, characters in the Lost Highway universe can die and return as long as there is the minimal amount of pretense that they are different characters in a different story. Mr. Eddie slash Dick Laurent is very similar to Anton Kreutzer, a character also played by Robert Loggia in the Oliver Stone produced miniseries Wild Palms. Kreutzer dies in that movie, but there's nothing to stop this Logian character from returning in another film. Kreutzer dies in a very ambiguous way, essentially vanishing after achieving his evil plan of transcending the physical plane. Or maybe those early 90s visual effects caused him to die of embarrassment. Is Lost Highway the next plane of existence in some metaphysical cinematic universe? It's not out of the question. This explains why Renee, not Alice, is having sex with Dick Laurent, not Mr. Eddie, in the Lost Highway Hotel. They are outside the diegesis and no longer need to pretend to be someone else. Also, their familiarity implies that the two had been having an affair prior to the first act. At Andy's party, Renee is worried when Fred mentions Dick Laurent. But Dick Laurent is dead, isn't he? Someone that Fred shouldn't even know. She is worried that he knows about the affair. It's possible that she does not even know that Laurent is dead and that she won't make this discovery until she dies herself. When the mystery man says this, Her name is Renee. If she told you her name is Alice, she's lying. He's actually telling the truth. But I just kind of glossed over Dick Laurent and Renee's lovemaking. It's time to explain what sex means in a movie that's full of it. If Fred and Pete are protagonists who represent protagonists, then what do their female counterparts represent? Let's look at the first scene with Fred and Renee, the second scene in the movie. Even though it's a fairly realistic and organic conversation, Really, it's just a list of things that Renee finds entertaining. I'm going to borrow a page from Rossiter and subtitle the scene with the subtext of what the characters are saying. You don't mind that I'm not coming to the club tonight? What are you going to do? Stay home. Read. Read. Read what? <laughs> No, I can still make you laugh. I like to laugh, Fred. That's why I married you. You can wake me up when you get home if you want to. She wants a romantic comedy, not a Lynchian film. But the two are married, committed, just like someone who likes mainstream films, but has come to see Lost Highway, has committed to sit there for two hours and 15 minutes. Lynch often associates watching a movie with dreaming and associates the relationship between the viewer and the film with sex. Both are done in the bedroom, and if you look at Fred and Renee's bedroom, the metaphor extends to the set design. There's a red curtain, and the window is exactly where the screen would be. Note that the window, which represents a very specific kind of light, is overexposed, only one of two times that something is overexposed in this film. The hallway is always dark, conspicuously and excessively dark. When a movie is playing in a theater, the hallway is always dark. The headboard for the bed has two curves in it, evoking the back of two theater chairs with pillows where the seat cushions would be. The bedroom is a movie theater. This convinces me that Fred and Renee's sex represents the communion between an audience and the film, and since their sex is bad, we can assume that Fred as a character is not appealing, at least not appealing to the kind of audience represented by Renee. Now Pete, on the other hand, is a movie star. His girlfriend, Sheila, is getting some great sex in Pete's Plymouth Belvedere. Since people might have sex in a bedroom or a car, the metaphor holds. The classic convertible represents the Pete movie. Pete's sex with Alice is equally pleasing for Alice. Or is it? Certainly it seems that way, but Alice performs in porn. She is an expert at faking sexual pleasure. The porn was shot in a hotel room, which stands in for the studio where an actor is pretending. That means that every time Alice is having sex in a hotel room, she is faking it. And every time she has sex, it's in a hotel room, except for her tryst with Pete on the desert floor, where she clearly rejects Pete. If Alice is really a black widow, she will try to curry favor with her mark. The last time we see Pete, he is having sex with Alice in front of the Ford Mustang on the barren desert floor. The headlights of the car illuminate them, evoking the light from a film projector. A film projector makes the image it doesn't illuminate something that's already there, but cause and effect is reversed again. Their bodies are overexposed like Hollywood as seen through the Madison's bedroom window, which represents a movie screen. We've already established that the Ford Mustang represents the film, and the desert exists outside the diegesis. We are seeing a representation of the film Lost Highway while watching the film Lost Highway. Alice projects Pete and leaves. Why? 
Well, Pete transforms back into Fred as if the adulation of his audience is the only thing that keeps Pete, Pete. And without it, he reverts back to the esoteric and alienating protagonist Fred. Did Alice want Pete to return to being Fred? I think so. Does Renee always represent the audience for a film? Well, not really. You can also draw parallels between the audience and the protagonist of a Lynch film, and that may explain why, in the final act, Renee is the subject of a film rather than the audience. She performs in Laurent's creepy porno. When we see the actual content of the porn made by Laurent, he and Renee are so excited that they are basically dry humping. This represents the subjective success of the film, wherein Laurent, the filmmaker, and Renee, the subject, have gross sex to symbolize the success in making a gross film. But then Andy stops getting off on looking at the film and starts getting off on watching Laurent and Renee. Andy has stopped watching the literal film in order to watch the metaphorical film. The link between sex and violence is clear when we actually see one of Laurent's films, and in the end it features the murder of a cast member, maybe a real murder. This is a reference to a snuff film, an urban legend but frightening nonetheless. It was assumed that sinister forces would actually murder someone on film and show it to lowlifes with big money on a kind of secret circuit. Just as works of exploitative sex might be called porn, works of exploitative violence might be called a snuff film. We feel completely disgusted by the scene, where nameless and presumably privileged individuals watch a morally reprehensible film and the filmmakers are borderline screwing. Andy and Laurent are creepy but they reach maximum creepiness here. Our emotional reaction trumps what should be our logical reaction to this scene, the fact that it is ridiculous. This is the fever dream of a delusional paranoiac. To think that Lynch is this creepy maker of films with exploitative sex and violence made for a sinister cabal that I assume represents art house devotees. This is Lynch presenting the straw man of himself. Andy's pencil-thin mustache, which an adult male must groom carefully, recalls the pencil-thin mustache an adolescent boy might have without trying. He's childish, made worse by the adult content of the childish films he devours. Most viewers of Lost Highway vaguely remember that Pete killed Andy, but that is doubtful. Andy launches himself at Pete with impossible force, and unless Pete did a judo kick to redirect Andy harmlessly over him, then Andy unintentionally killed himself. Oh. Andy literally destroys his brain and the death involves a coffee table, which might be a permanent fixture of one's TV viewing environment. Alice's plan was to steal Andy's cash, but she never talks about that cash ever again. She steals his valuables, but we never talk about those either. However, Alice does steal his car. In fact, the plan seems to revolve around the outcome of Alice and Pete taking off in that particular car, a red 1965 Ford Mustang. They take his car onto the Lost Highway, and this implies that they need this particular car to get onto the Lost Highway. Why does Andy have the magic car? Let's look at Andy's house at 2224 Deep Dell Place. Deep Dell Place is a small road in the Hollywood Hills just south of the Hollywood sign. Andy's house appears to be having a Hollywood party in every sense of the word. Everyone is so immersed in show business that a pale gremlin who broadly symbolizes the community is casually greeted. Even though this is one short shot, I think it's one of the most revealing. The mystery man is having a pleasant chat with some showbiz hipsters. This is one of the many reasons that I think he represents the filmmaking community at large. Many films use the circa 1965 Ford Mustang as a cool car, including Bullet and Goldfinger, and there are places in real Hollywood that own and maintain these cars to rent out to productions. Andy apparently has his own 1965 Red Ford Mustang, but is it the cool car from the films, or is it the cool car from the real world that is used in films to be that car? Oftentimes, production cars are owned by people with too much money and not enough brains. Wanting to own the car from the movie indicates that, in the mind of the wealthy idiot, fantasy and reality have blurred. We never see the murder, and while Fred is troubled, does trouble translate into cut his wife into pieces? We see two seconds of Renee's cut up body and blood and guts and a shirtless Fred looking up at the camera, confused as if someone just dropped him there. Even if we assume that Fred was dispositionally capable of killing his wife, how and why did he carve her up into pieces? Let's look at the murder of Renee. Did Fred go get a chainsaw and cut up Renee? Of course not. Note that the cut areas on Renee are where the seams would be if she was a mannequin or a doll. The arms and legs aren't bending. The lower torso hasn't collapsed. The severed body parts are rigid, as if they were a hard shell filled with blood and guts. In fact, the blood and guts don't really seem to be from the body. It looks like the viscera were just dumped on top of the body parts. I'm not saying that Renee wasn't murdered, she was. But since an actress playing a character being murdered would be replaced with a dummy, 
Then Renee looks like a dummy, but she was still murdered. The plastic corpse that we, the audience, can recognize as fake is unquestionably a real body to the characters in the diegesis, especially the police, judge, and jury. This is why Fred was convicted. The only close-up of dead Renee's face is distorted. If it wasn't distorted, would we see that it's a plastic head? I think yes. When Fred sees the videotape of the murder, it must be an event from the film, since the videotapes are all events from the film. When we see a flash of the murder in clear color 35mm film, that is how we know it is real, in terms of being an event in the diegesis of the film. The fact that we cannot connect the image of Fred sitting among the remains to any point in the plot implies that it was manufactured. But why? And by who? Since the mystery man seems to be able to do magic, and since he seems to have evil intentions, he is the obvious culprit. But again, why? Does the mystery man just torment Fred because he's a bastard? What does he have to gain? Let's go backwards in the story to try to uncover the mystery man's motives. In the end, he kills Dick Laurent. Before that, he had Fred at his front door. Here I am. Let's further assume that he needed Fred to help him commit the murder. Prior to Pete transforming back into Fred, Fred is in prison and the mystery man opens the curtains to reveal himself. While there was a lot of symbolic value here, on a literal level, the mystery man is giving Fred the option of joining him or staying in prison. This means that the mystery man has motive to frame Fred for murder so he can extort Fred's cooperation for his freedom. And now we can understand the movie. The entire plot of Lost Highway is the story of the mystery man planning Dick Laurent's murder. But why would the mystery man turn Fred into Pete? He didn't. The two events have different causes. The mystery man is planning for Fred to enter the portal and join him, but then the film itself intervenes and turns Fred into Pete. This effectively foils the mystery man's plan. The second act of the movie is the mystery man revising his plan to deal with Fred's transformation. Now we can finally look at the film in terms of the story. And what a story. So let's look at the last scene featuring the mystery man. The mystery man shows Laurent a TV screen, which according to the rules is showing Laurent something that actually happened in the film. In fact, the last thing we see in the monitor is the very next shot in the film. Dick Laurent is watching the movie Lost Highway while he's in the movie Lost Highway. The portable TV shows Laurent proudly premiering the grotesque porn snuff film. The mystery man is essentially putting Laurent on trial and showing that Laurent who considers himself an artist, relies on exploitative sex and violence. He is merely trying to out-ugly his fellow filmmakers. Lynch critics say that Lynch isn't clever, he just does shocking things and he's considered a genius. But note the similarities to the film within a film and the film. There is sex and boobs mixed with eruptions of violence that seem to come out of nowhere. It is disjointed with no apparent story. The movie in Lost Highway represents Lost Highway. The mystery man, filmmakers, and Fred the content of films, have tried Dick Laurent, David Lynch, according to them, and presumably found him guilty and executed him. But why does the mystery man need Fred? And why does the execution have to happen in some random location in the Mojave Desert? To kill Laurent, they need to transport him to a location that is remote in the diegesis and in the real world. Since the Mojave Desert is backstage in the Lost Highway universe, and it's also a remote location in real life, then he would be killed outside the diegesis, meaning he's really dead. No more returning as Mr. Reddy, and the killers get away. Can the mystery man pistol whip Laurent and toss him in the trunk? No. The only way to do this without leaving any evidence outside the diegesis is to have a fictional character do it. Fred is apparently the perfect choice. In fact, the mystery man has been manipulating him from the beginning. It seemed that the mystery man's behavior was nebulous, mysterious, as if he merely wanted to torment Fred. But no, he's been executing a rational plan that, in many ways, is quite brilliant. When Fred is loading Laurent into the trunk of the car, we pull out to see that the mystery man is watching them. Although his face betrays no emotion, he seems unsurprised, like he expected to see this. He is cautiously optimistic. Also, this is the only time we see the mystery man by himself, and the only time we see him being himself. This doesn't look like someone who is improvising or going with the flow. This looks like someone confirming that things are going according to plan. I think that this is Lynch's biggest clue that Lost Highway is the story of the mystery man's scheme to kill Dick Laurent. Rene leaves Laurent early just before the abduction. It is likely that Rene is setting up Laurent. Maybe she knows that Fred is right behind her. Rene gets into a car that we've never seen before and drives off. The red Mustang doesn't have a trunk, so Fred loads Laurent into the trunk of his own Mercedes-Benz, and now we can understand a very mysterious phone call. When Fred returns, the mystery man scares Fred when he pulls out a video camera. Fred actually saw the camera twice, and maybe this is what he saw, a weird guy with a camera, generally speaking. Fred runs away, but is it because he's afraid of the camera? If he was afraid of the camera, he would just drive off as fast as he can. 
but he drives to the Lost Highway Hotel and executes the plan. The mystery man is not scaring him away, but scaring him into action. But how could Fred know what the plan is? When Fred turns into Pete, Pete doesn't seem to have any memories of his life as Fred. However, Pete does not understand the metaphysics of being a fictional character while Fred does. So I suspect that when Fred returns, he has all of Pete's memories, including the memories of the time that Mr. Eddie and the mystery man called Pete. It seems that Laurent and the mystery man are just calling to torment Pete. Certainly Pete doesn't have any idea what's going on and he's scared, but let's look at the mystery man's monologue. In the East, the Far East, when a person is sentenced to death, they're sent to a place where they can't escape never knowing when an executioner may step up behind them and fire a bullet into the back of their head. What's going on? The Mojave Desert is far east of Los Angeles. Far is subjective. Dick Laurent is locked in a trunk and then an executioner shoots him in the head. The mystery man is giving Fred the instructions through Pete. But why speak in code? While he's standing next to Dick Laurent, he can't say here's the plan to kill Dick Laurent. After this, with the help of Alice, Fred is delivered to the mystery man's doorstep, while Pete is delivered there. None of the reasons that Alice gives for driving the red Mustang to the shack in the desert make any sense, so I assume that Alice was making excuses to get Pete to do as she commanded. When Alice rejects Pete, You'll never have me. Pete turns back into Fred. The person who says Dick Laurent is dead to Fred is telling him that Dick Laurent, the director of the movie, has died. Fred is free. Perhaps that's good news, but Fred doesn't understand the message, so he continues with his business. Since Mr. Eddie has a history of hanging out with Pete, Dick Laurent must have returned to life while the Fred movie is happening. I would speculate that off-screen, the mystery man is kicking himself. He killed Laurent in the diegesis, and therefore he did not kill him. The mystery man formulates the plan that will eventually be executed and starts the process of getting Fred to understand that he is a character in a movie. The simplest and most effective way to do that is to send Fred a videotape transfer of the movie that Fred is in. The first videotape is a dud. It's just a shot of the front of the house. Creepy, but not anything that would change one's worldview. The second videotape has footage of Fred and Renee. This is also ineffective, and Fred and Renee assume that some psycho broke into the house. When Fred, Renee, and the cops exit the house, the camera is high above them. The shot of Fred and Renee in the bed was supposed to be very high and pointing straight down, a graphic match to the camera on the crane outside the house. The camera looks straight down on the characters. Fred is constantly paranoid about someone above him, looking down. But he's not completely paranoid. There is a creepy entity looking down on him. The camera. With the videotapes failing to convince Fred, the mystery man needs to do something drastic and appear in person to Fred. I don't know if the mystery man can appear anywhere in the diegesis, but he can definitely appear in Andy's house, so perhaps it was a lucky break that Fred and Renee attended a party. Here, the mystery man has a simple goal. Get Fred to go home. I mean, you're where right now? At your house. That's fucking crazy, man. Call me. I told you I was here. Fred is supposed to be at the party all night, so if he gets home early, the home won't entirely be there. Fred will encounter the truth of his reality. And so, there you go. The movie is the account of the mystery man's plan to kill Dick Laurent. The mystery man wins and the movie is over. Right? But of course, no, that's not how it ends. For some reason, Lynch gives us a long, long take of Don breaking over the body of Dick Laurent. Why is that? We know that he's dead and we can assume that eventually the sun will rise. What's the importance of this shot? Well, let's look at the locations outside of the diegesis. They all happen at night. Of course they do. The area outside of the set or location is dark, sometimes pitch black depending on the circumstances. It's always dark outside the diegesis, just as, on a real film set, the stage is dark with a kind of bubble of light where the action takes place. The hallway in the Madison house, which should be thought of as a hole in the diegesis, is constantly excessively dark. But if dawn is breaking, we're in the diegesis. Did the mystery man miscalculate? No. You see, you cannot kill Dick Laurent in real life because Dick Laurent is not a real person. He is a straw man. David Lynch isn't a violent gangster, he's an Eagle Scout from Missoula. Dick Laurent's murder has to be a work of fiction. Therefore, once Dick Laurent is murdered, the diegesis expands to incorporate the murder. This symbolizes a failed attempt to make the unreal real. You can't do it. Now the narrative is catastrophically damaged. Continuity has been breached. A character who has already been murdered is murdered. Even a movie this bananas cannot allow that. We know that the movie itself has agency. 
So what does the movie do to fix this? The film moves the second murder back in time to retroactively be the first murder. The phrase timeline is not entirely metaphorical. The physical celluloid is a literal timeline of the film and it can be twisted. There is an overlap between the first few minutes and the last few minutes of the movie. If you line up the beginning and end of the movie and adjust the time so that the line Dick Laurent is dead takes the same amount of time, this happens. Dick Laurent is dead. Read. In spite of Fred's apparent immolation, it is the mystery man who is the loser. He is doomed to repeat the same failed plan over and over again. Who's the winner? David Lynch. He exists outside the diegesis in terms of the rules of the movie and in real life. These creeps who are trying to bring him down are just repeating the same useless actions over and over again. They are spinning their wheels. Lynch has said that Lost Highway comes out of a dark place. I interpret that as Lynch feeling wronged. This is the inspiration for the film. The idea that the characters of a film would be used as tools for agents outside the diegesis to do destructive things is not so abstract. After Lynch left Twin Peaks, the remaining staff took the show in a very different direction and viewers had to watch these characters they love become something else and do uninteresting things for 14 episodes. When he didn't get final cut on Dune, the film was different than what he had wanted, so for him, it must have been as if the characters were obeying an unseen, sinister force. His films are criticized for being misogynistic, homophobic, too violent, or in some way supporting a toxic worldview. But to Lynch, these criticisms are made by people who don't understand his films, so it's like they are criticizing some other non-existent person. A straw man. Dick Laurent. When Laurent is dry-humping Rene, this must be what Lynch detractors are thinking of when he's working with all these beautiful young women and getting close with them. Just like the mystery man and Fred presenting evidence of Laurent's guilt and the off-screen formal trial of Fred, Lynch has been railroaded. The mystery man is unambiguously a friend of Dick Laurent and Al and Ed were friends with Fred until they brutalized him. Everyone gets stabbed in the back and I believe that Lynch perceives himself like that. So Lost Highway is a dark story about dark times and it has a dark ending. However, you could think of Lost Highway as Lynch's way of making something good out of bad circumstances. That's what an Eagle Scout from Missoula would do. So I guess the takeaway of this essay is, if you want to make dark, surreal films, then I want you to get this manual. I want you to study that motherfucker! Follow me, boys, follow me. When you think you're really me, that's the time to lift your feet and follow me. There's a job to do, there's a fight to win. Follow me, boys, follow me. And it won't be done till we all pitch in. Lift your chin with a grin and follow me.